you have a Bible, join me tonight in Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, in this series, Lord Change My Attitude, we're looking at the five negative Old Testament attitudes that can be replaced with the five positive New Testament counterpart attitudes. And tonight, we'll see how we can put off the old attitude of complaining and replace it with a good attitude of thankfulness. Thankfulness is the perfect replacement for complaining. Would you please stand with me as we look into Luke chapter 17? As we go to the next slide, uh, we have the title there, the next slide, replacing uh, the complaining attitude with thankfulness. Verse 11 in Luke 17. It came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. And with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. But he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God. Save this stranger, this foreigner, this Samaritan. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith, hath made thee whole. Church family, do we not have so much to be grateful for? Uh, when, you, when you look and consider what's happening in Ukraine, when you look to see what's happening in Israel and in Gaza, and here we are in such peace and safety and prosperity. And so let's pray for those that are going through the time of suffering, uh, both there in Israel, Gaza, and uh, Ukraine. May we pray. Lord, we ask that we might have truly grateful hearts for who you are and for what you have done. And I pray that, that as we consider the blessings we have and as we consider those in great trials of physical affliction, we pray for them. We pray for those in Ukraine. We pray you'd bring an end uh, to the war we pray for the leaders to come to you in salvation. We pray for the soldiers. We pray that there might be circumstances where they come across a Bible, a tract, a witness, a Christian, and that you'd save many on both sides. We pray uh, for the terrorists, uh, both to be brought to justice and salvation uh, there in Gaza. We pray for wisdom for the leaders, both in America and Israel and other nations as we seek to see the rescue of the hostages. We pray for the peace of Israel. I pray now, God, as we uh, consider the, the, the trials of living in a sin-cursed world, and yet we're so blessed. So, Father, fill our hearts with gratitude. May it overflow from our attitude, our words, our actions, uh, that we in turn may glorify you from our hearts as we give praise to our great and wonderful God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, thank you, you may be seated. So here's the famous story of the 10 lepers. This is nothing new. Since the beginning of time, people have had this attitude. God, God help me. God, do this for me. God, do that for me. God, I, I need this, I need that. And that's what happened here. These men have a real need, they have a physical need. They have leprosy. No time for God when things are going well, but in time of need, oh Lord, help me. Everyone's on their knees. Now the New Testament, when you see the word leprosy, it, it covers a, a variety of skin diseases which brought pain and suffering and death. It made the victims an outcast of society. In order to get back to their families, they had to actually get approval from the priests that they were healed and that they were not contagious to infect 
other people. And so that's what Jesus commanded them to do. He said, I want you to go to the priests. And as they, in fact, moved in that direction, as they believed the, and followed the instruction, they were actually healed. When they were further down the road, they suddenly realized they were completely healed. And one shouted out, hey, hey, I'm healed. Look at me. It's all gone. Hooray. And all at once, all 10 lepers were healed. Each had received this amazing gift of healing from God. Incredible. And when they saw that they were healed, nine kept on going. Oh, I can't wait to be pronounced clean by the priest so I can get home to my family, to my wife and kids. Nine kept on going, verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. He turned back to express thanksgiving to Jesus. I mean, he was fired up with gratitude. And so notice his his humility in verse 16. And he fell down on his face at his feet, at Jesus' feet. And he gave him thanks. And then the commentary, and he was a Samaritan. He not only fell down, but he did so as a Samaritan. The Samaritans, as we know, are hated by the Jews. There's deep prejudice, and it's vice versa. Uh, so much so that the Jewish people would go out of their way to go around Samaria, which is right in the middle of Israel, and they would go uh, over to Perea. They would uh, go up or, or north or south on either side to avoid them because they just despised them. They were considered uh, half Jew, half Gentile, half breed, and they had a false religion. But if a Samaritan can give thanks to a Jewish man, then we certainly have no excuses from stopping us to be thankful. Sadly, only a fraction of the human population ever personally thanks God for his grace. You know, you know there's an, another lesson here. Jesus is the only solution for prejudice in the world. The government is not going to solve the issue of prejudice, but the Lord Jesus Christ, he can. What we have here are 10 lepers that are healed, but only one shows an attitude of gratitude. Now they all chose an attitude. They all chose an attitude, but only one chose the attitude to be able to give thanks, and Jesus noticed. Uh, Jesus also noticed the ungrateful. Look with me at verse 17. Jesus answered, said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Now it's a rhetorical question, right? It's a rhetorical question. He was simply pointing out their outrageous, thankless attitude. Verse 18, they are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And then Jesus turns to the man who is thankful, and look what he says in verse 19. Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, he's already physically healed. Thy faith hath made thee whole. All ten of the lepers were cleansed. All ten received physical healing. But Jesus is saying, because of your faith, which has been evidenced by your thankfulness, you have been made spiritually whole. You have been saved. You've been saved. You're going to heaven. Thankfulness. Where do we begin? Thankfulness begins when we acknowledge God as the gracious giver of all blessings, life and health, food and shelter. What did James say? Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no uh, neither valuableness, neither shadow of turning. Once we do this, we can recognize our need to know the Lord in a personal way. We can receive Christ as our personal Savior. Only when I acknowledge that there is a God and that he has given to me more than I deserve and that I owe him something, no, no, I owe him everything, I can come to Christ. Uh, would you please turn with me out to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we have, we have the Apostle Paul uh, giving this this wonderful treatise on salvation. And he begins by explaining we sin. 
We all sin, everyone. There's a penalty for sin, and Christ is the only answer for that. And Paul made this same point about unthankfulness here in Romans chapter 1. Notice in verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. What he's saying is, God created the universe. And with a heart, within the heart of every person, there is an awareness that God exists. When someone says, well, I'm an atheist, you have to ask the question, well, when did you become an atheist? Because you weren't born that way. You were born with an understanding that there is a God, and you had to make a conscious choice to turn away from God to become an atheist. And apart from thankfulness, our awareness of God will always be suppressed. Only an unthankful person will look at the world and say, there is no God. There is no God. God has a commentary about those people. It's in Psalm 14, 1. The what? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Creation is not the accident of a mindless explosion. You don't get creativity from a random accident any more than if you, you dropped a bomb uh, on a printing factory and the result was a, a dictionary comes out in a foreign language. It just ain't gonna happen. Like, never. There's not the possibility of it happening. It doesn't exist. In the same way, in the same way, the solar eclipse that is going to happen tomorrow is not the result of an evolutionary accident. Impossible. <clears throat> it could never happen on its own. <clears throat> it is the engineering, the engineering wonder of a divine genius who we call our creator God. Now notice here in Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, and, and the eclipse is one of those things, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. At the root of mankind's rejection of God is a strong unwillingness to be thankful. And that's pride. That's pride. Uh, to be able to have a, 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 a sun that is 400 times bigger than the moon and 400 times farther away uh, to give the appearance that both the sun and the moon appear to be the same size in the sky, that was an engineering marvel by God as a witness to us. Thankfulness is far more than just saying the right words. If your parents were like mine, they taught you to say thank you. Say thank you, right? It's, it's just, it, it's not from the heart. It's just, where it's, you say thank you. You say thank you, and then you grow up and you have kids, and then guess what you do? You say to the kids, say thank you, say thank you. And so, so there's this verbalizing, we're saying it out loud because it's the right thing to do. Why is it right? Why is it good? May I point out, it's also helpful. Uh, one magazine, Mind and Body, published an article entitled, 20 Ways to Feel Calmer, Happier, and Healthier. I'll give you the number one answer. It is, quote, to be thankful for all the good in your life. Researchers found that gratitude directed toward God is a powerful source of health and well-being. Listen to these studies on the benefits of being thankful. A thankful attitude lowers your stress. Anybody go through stress this last year? Oh, sure. Well, being thankful will lower your stress. It helps surgery recovery. It makes you happier. It lowers your blood pressure. How many times has the doctor said, oh, oh you got high blood pressure, let me write you a prescription. You need to be thankful 10 times a day. It decreases depression. It helps you live longer. Regarding stress, in a Northern California uh, a study was done on stress, nearly 7,000 Californians showed that West Coast 
worshipers who participated in church-sponsored activities are markedly less stressed over finances, over health, over other daily concerns than their non-spiritual counterparts. Regarding blood pressure, elderly folks in a Duke University study on those who attend church, pray, read the Bible regularly, had lower blood pressure uh, than their non-practicing peers. Recovering from surgery, another Duke University study looked at patients of faith recovering from, from major surgeries, the surgeries that require, you know, multiple days in the hospital. Not like today, oh, oh, we replace your hip, go home today. We replace your knee, go home today. Uh, we replace your liver, go home today. No, no, no. I'm talking major surgeries that require multiple days in the hospital, and they found that, that the people of faith spent half the time in the hospital recovering as those who did not have faith. Regarding depression, women with believing mothers, Christian mothers, are 60% less likely to be depressed 10 years after they leave home. That's a Columbia University study. That's not a bastion of Christian, right? Christianity. Daughters belonging to the same religious faith as their mothers are 71% less likely to suffer the blues. Sons, 84% less likely to have life crisis if they belong to the same faith group as their mothers. Regarding life expectancy, research on more than 1,900 older adults indicated that those who attend religious services regularly have a lower mortality rate in their age bracket than those who do not. Definition of gratitude, the word gratitude is defined in the Oxford Dictionary this way, to show that a kindness received is valued. To show that a kindness received is valued. Genuine gratitude requires that we get past the obligation and somehow show that we deeply appreciate what we have received. Let me give you a quick test came to church this morning, I think most of you did, and uh, as you were, were, were driving into the parking lot, uh, as you strolled into the building, maybe you came into the kids' entrance or the back main entrance, and you, you, you were handed a bulletin, you sat down. Now, truthfully, did any, did any of these thoughts enter your mind? What am I going to get today? Am I going to be encouraged? Will I like the pastor's message? Will he keep my attention and make me smile? Will I be glad I came? And if all of your thoughts were about what am I going to get, what am I going to receive, if that's the kind of thinking that you have as you prepare your heart for worship, it reveals more of a self-centered, thankless attitude that promotes what? Complaining, and it stifles gratitude. The truth is, if we never received anything from God for the rest of our lives, we could still fill each day with genuine gratitude. Are you thanking God that you're alive? Thank God for this new day. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you for the life uh, that I now live, that I can serve you. Thank you for the breath that I can praise you. Thank you for the health, the measure of health that I have. Thank you, Lord, for strength and family and church family. Thank you, most of all, for my salvation. It's so easy to focus on what we want, what we think we need, rather than what we already have. And that's where complaining comes in. We minimize the blessings and we magnify every negative circumstance that we face. Oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe the nursery workers are late today. Oh, I'm so upset. I, I'm just sick and tired of this lousy weather. When is it going to stop? When is spring going to come? Why can't the kids remember to pick up after themselves? So let's, let's kind of go through it here. We, we have the parents teaching the kids. They taught us. We teach them. Say thank you, say thank you. So let's go through the levels of gratitude. Level one, thanks for good things. This teaches us to be thankful in the most basic sense. Hebrews 13, 15, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, 
giving thanks to his name. I mean, this is kind of like the elementary school uh, is the sacrifice of thanks, thankfulness. God, you help me, and I say thanks. I've met my obligation. Level two, uh, it's a better place. Looking for good things and everything, give thanks. In every situation, you and I can find something to be thankful for. Always, we can, we can make a decision to look away from the negative, and we can focus on what is right and give thanks. Uh, this level is going to produce a joy in your heart as long as you are not going through anything difficult. One more level, level three, thankfulness. This goes beyond the level two thankfulness, which searches to find a good thing to be thankful for. This is the thankfulness that trusts God and is grateful even for the difficult trials even for things you wouldn't choose. In everything give thanks, verse 17, verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Thessalonians says it in all things. Ephesians says it always for all things. I mean, this is kind of like the Mount Everest of thanksgiving. It, it, it promises victory over every circumstance. Maybe you're facing a health crisis right now maybe you're in a great sorrow that won't go away it might be financial it might be work related it might be family related uh, when we can say thank you God thank you you have allowed this trial in my life to use for your glory and I accept it I trust you thank you God even for this it's, it's the Job response the Lord giveth the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Because we recognize who God is and how wonderful he is to us. When we allow the Lord to bring us into that kind of thankfulness, we will experience a depth of joy we never thought possible. Uh, turn with me to Psalm 107. There's an a interesting way that the psalmist addressed it here in Psalm 107. And then we'll see that that this thankfulness is really a decision. In Psalm 107 and verse 8. Well, let's do verse 1 first. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 107, verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 15. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 21, would you say it with me? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And then one more, verse 31. Say it with me. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And so there's, there's a, what, five times it's repeated. What's he trying to do? He's trying to give us a message. Oh, the men would do this, and women, and teens, and children. So I want you to notice that thankfulness is a decision. It's a decision. It's a choice that we make. It's just as real as any other decision. It says, oh, the men would, meaning we can. It's a choice. It doesn't say, it doesn't say could. It says would. We can if we choose to. And so God has made us with the capacity to express gratitude. It's a choice that we make. You can choose your attitude as much as you choose your diet, you choose your clothes, uh, you choose when you're gonna go to bed and when you're gonna wake up, you get to choose gratitude. And if the sun came up today, then we have a reason to give thanks because God's mercy is new. Secondly, thankfulness is a decision based on What's well, based from truth and reality? Do we really have a lot to be thankful for? In the Bunhill Fields Cemetery, it's across from where uh, John Wesley had, uh, John Charles Wesley had that, that famous church. Uh, this cemetery has the burial markers of John Bunyan and Isaac Watts. Also buried there is Daniel Defoe. Now you may recognize that name, uh, more so from the book that he wrote. He's the author of Robinson Crusoe. And Defoe, he was a devout Christian. 
and he almost, he almost went into the ministry. Now, this classic story is about a man who was shipwrecked, and he spent 27 years on a tropical island. And his story illustrates, illustrates perfectly thankfulness is a decision based in truth and reality. We find our hero cast on this island all by himself. Here is his journal entry. Listen to what Defoe wrote. I now begin to consider how seriously my condition and the circumstance I was reduced to. I drew up the state of my affairs in writing to deliver my thoughts from daily pouring upon them and afflicting my mind. As my reasoning began now to master my despondency, I began to comfort myself as well as I could and to set the good against the evil that it might have something to distinguish my case from that is much worse. So I stated very impartially, like a debtor and a creditor, the comforts I enjoyed and the miseries I suffered. And so let's call the list, he wrote, the complaining list and the thankful list. Notice the deliberate choices of thankfulness based in the truth and the reality he was facing. So here it is, Robinson Crusoe's complaining list. I am cast upon a horrible desert island, void of all hope of recovery. Robinson Crusoe's thankful list. That I am alive and not drowned as all of my ship, ship's company was. Complaining list. I am singled out and separate as it were from all the world to be miserable. Thankful list. But I am singled out, took from all of the ship's crew to be spared from death. God who miraculously saved me from death can also deliver me from this condition also. Complaining list. I have no clothes to cover me. Thankful list. But I'm in a hot climate where if I had clothes, I could not wear them. Complaining list. I have no soul to speak to or relieve me. Thankful list. But God wonderfully sent the ship in near enough to the shore that I have gotten out so many necessary things as will either supply my wants or enable me to supply myself even as long as I live. You get to choose. It's a choice based on truth and reality. So ask God to change your attitude before you become a card-carrying member of the Complaining Wilderness Club. One more. Thankfulness is a life-changing decision. Oh, that men and women would praise the Lord. Notice there's a passion. There's a zeal here. There's something to get excited about. So honest answers to bring life change. Here's the question. Am I a thankful person? Am I a thankful person? How do people perceive you? Do they perceive you as being thankful and grateful? Uh, more than 250 years ago, there was a, a famous Bible scholar named Matthew Henry, and he wrote these words in his diary after being robbed of all the money he had in the world. Let me be thankful first. Thankful? You were just robbed. Let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. <laughs> Second, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, let me be thankful that although they took my all, it was not much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. No doubt about it, thankfulness is a choice. Answer the question, am I a thankful person? Number two, am I seeing the blessings of thankfulness in my life? Am I seeing the blessings of thankfulness in my life? Do I have the joy that comes with gratitude? Or is my life like a wilderness? How much time do you spend thinking about the good, the positive, the praiseworthy things? That means you probably are going to have to limit your time watching and listening to the news. You say, oh, I need to know what's going on. Well, you do. 
The men of Issachar understood the times. But what could be 10 minutes could turn into two hours. And all of a sudden, man, look at those people coming across the, 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 uh, uh, the southern border. Well, now they're coming across the northern border. Oh, they're, they're coming from China. They're, oh, 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 oh. And you get all upset over the bad news that's dominating uh, everyone else. When we're thankful, we see the joy in life. Third question, am I choosing thankfulness over complaining moment by moment? Gratitude is one moment at a time. Ask yourself, am I, am I choosing thankfulness right now? Remember, attitudes are patterns. Attitudes are patterns of thinking formed over long periods of time. And to break a bad habit and to start a new habit, it's going to take some time, but you have to be determined. And they begin moment by moment. Choose to be thankful moment by moment. Begin and end the day in gratitude starting tonight starting tonight when you wake up in the morning may it be your first thoughts to thank God for three things that he gave you yesterday I mean before you even get out of bed before your feet hit the floor be thanking God for three things that he did for you the day before because what you think about affects how you feel Father thank you for your word thank you for the power of it we know that this is a topic that is dear to your heart. May it be dear to our hearts. May we desire from our heart to be grateful for who you are, for what you have done. Now, Lord, in those difficult seasons, when the trials come, may we know that you have a purpose to purify us, teach us patience, to allow us to be able to become a help to others because of what we receive through the comfort that you give to us. God, give us grateful hearts. Help us to be the example to others that are struggling in their spiritual journey. Christian, would you take a moment? Would you just thank God? for how he has blessed you. Salvation, health, family, church, country, work, retirement, friendship, fellowship, giftedness, ability to serve him and others. Oh, that men and women would praise the Lord for his wonderful works to the children of men. Father, you are good all the time, and for that we give you praise. Arrest our attention when the complaining thoughts and words dominate our heart and tongue. May we repent and turn from what you consider sinful and ingratitude before you and others. Grow this fruit and virtue gratitude in our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name.